Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. I'm excited today as we continue our series on the book of Acts. If you've missed any in this series, you'll want to go to our website, look at the whole series, hopetv.org slash hopess. You can find the series today, The Conversion of Paul. Maybe we should call it The Conversion of Saul. That's how he was called by his Hebrew name, but it's an amazing story. In fact, some people think it's the most remarkable evidence of the power of the gospel. So we're glad you joined us for Hope Sabbath School today. Have you been enjoying the series? Yes. It's been amazing, hasn't it? You know, I love the book of Acts. In fact, I watched, you know, there's like the Gospel of John on video and the Gospel of Matthews on video verbatim. Well, they have the, gospel, the book of Acts now. And I watched it and just watch it and you say, that is amazing. Could it happen again today? Mm -hmm. yes. And the answer is it has to, right? Mm -hmm. We need to understand this amazing book of Acts and today how God can change a person's life, how he can change our lives. Here's a few emails from Hope Sabbath School members around the world. Simba Rashe, abbreviated to Simba, writes from Zimbabwe. Any, we don't have anyone from Zimbabwe today. I'm enjoying Hope Sabbath School lessons every week. Sometimes I have different views from the Bible, but during Hope Sabbath School's interactive discussion, more brilliant ideas are received and the Holy Spirit is talking to me. Amen. Amen. That's beautiful, isn't it? God bless you. Well, you know, we do learn from each other. I'm sure, Simba Rasha, if you were with us, we'd learn some from you by the Holy Spirit too, but we're glad you're part of our Hope Sabbath School family. Just a short note, short note from Sue in South Dakota in the United States. I love Hope Sabbath School. I live in South Dakota. Thank you to everyone who contributes. Well, I don't know that we've had a note from South Dakota before. We have how many states in the United States? 50. 50 plus Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia. I think we've heard from most places, but we're glad that we have Hope Sabbath School members in South Dakota. Here's a note from a donor, won't mention the name, in New York, but it touched my heart. It says, please see our loved gift for Hope Sabbath School, donor-supported ministry. God, may God continue to use your ministry to preach the everlasting gospel to a dying world. Amen? Amen. The person goes on to say, there is so much of Satan's deception in the world. Mm -hmm. Your ministry has been a blessing to me and my husband on a daily basis. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for writing to us from New York. And you're part of the miracle when we all join together. Here's a note from Emmanuel in Rivers State, Nigeria. And uh, Emmanuel says, I enjoy studying Hope Sabbath School every day. It's always interactive and everyone contributes. I really love the setting. <laughs> May the Lord bless you as you teach and reach out to many around the world. Amen. Amen. Well, Emmanuel, if you ever come over to the United States, we'd love to have you on Hope Sabbath School. Here's one last note from Belgium, from Deirdre. Deirdre. And she says, I'm from Antwerp and I was so thrilled to hear a Hope Sabbath School testimony from Peter. He's a member of our Antwerp church and I introduced him to Hope Sabbath School. Yes. So she heard a testimony from Peter. I travel a lot, so I'm not often at my home church, but I always watch Hope Sabbath School. May the most gracious Holy Father in heaven continue blessing you all for the work that you're doing, reaching out to millions. Your sister in Christ, Deirdre. Well, thanks so much for being a witness there in Antwerp and wherever you go as you're traveling in your work. We, we believe God's given us all a circle of influence and we can be a blessing to those around us. Right now, we want to sing our theme song. It's 3,000 years old, Psalm 105, verses 1 to 5. And I'm thankful that my wife wrote a little tune to help us memorize it. If you haven't learned it yet, you can go to our website and download the sheet music and the mp3 file. Some people even try to sing it in their own language if you can make the words fit to the melody. And uh, we'll hide that word in our hearts. So let's sing it together right now. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Those 
That's what we want to do right now is call upon his name. That means to just connect with him, right? We can do that in prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to guide as we study about the conversion of Paul. I invite you to join with us as we pray together. Father in heaven, this topic is not just about a man whose life was radically changed 2,000 years ago. It's about what you can do in each heart that is open to you. And I'm praying that miracles would happen even as we study today by the power of Jesus and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we will give you thanks forever in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, it's interesting as you look at the book of Acts, and that's the topic of our, our theme of our study for this series, that, that actually, is it three times in the book of Acts that, that Paul gives his testimony? Mm -hmm. There's just something really important about what happened to him. Yes. And as I mentioned, some, some Bible scholars and even those who don't believe in Christianity say that is the most startling evidence of the power of the gospel. Because this man, what was he like before? Well, let's start our study by reading from Acts 26, verses 9 through 11. Nicole, maybe you can start our study today. This is not what bad press, you know, fake news that people mm -hmm. are saying about him. This is his own confession of what he was like before he met Jesus. Sure. The New International Version of Acts 26, verses 9 through 11 says, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. Mm -hmm. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. Wow. Now, I don't know if you've ever blasphemed the name of Jesus. You've, you've taken his name in vain. That's one thing, but to force other people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to blaspheme the name of Jesus. I, I don't know how much worse you could get than that. Why, why do you think Rodney, his persecution of these followers of Jesus was so fierce and relentless? He believed in what he was doing. Yeah. We, we, in a previous study, we spoke about some of the disciples like Peter. They really believed and they just did the mission. I believe Saul, he believed in what he was doing. Mm -hmm. So he was dedicated. Oh, absolutely. Anybody else? Why, do you th why was he so fierce? Was that just the way he was? I mean, is he fierce after he becomes a follower yeah, of Jesus? He is. He's intense just an intense person? Yeah. Yeah. Jonathan, what do you think? I think he was afraid for losing his religion. I mean, he, he saw this religion of his being attacked and um, compromised by this new uh, force. And he's like, no, I'm going to be the hand of God to protect it, I guess. So maybe a mixture of, of zeal yeah. and, and some fear that, that everything, I mean, doesn't he say I did everything right, circumcised mm -hmm. the eighth day, mm -hmm. you know, Pharisee of the Pharisees, according to the law, blameless. This was his whole life, and, mm -hmm. and, and it seemed that some people were, were dismantling it, or at least saying, now we need to accept the Messiah. Travis? I think about what he wrote in Romans chapter 7, how he struggled with all these things, and then at the end, a wicked man that I am, who's going to deliver me? And when he, after his conversion, he realized that his righteousness didn't come from him and he got a peace that was within instead of a... That's worse. talking about his spiritual struggle, but the intensity, maybe that was part of his personality. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and why didn't God give up on him? Because he was so fierce, Stephanie, in forcing people to blaspheme the name of Jesus. That's what I think is so neat about God is that he sees us 
not as we are, but as what we can become mm -hmm. if we surrender our lives to him. And I believe that he saw in Saul what he could become and what his energies would do for him if it was on the right side. So there is a text that says, for the joys that was, joy that was set before him, that Jesus yes. endured the cross, mm -hmm. despising the shame. Yes. Maybe one of the joys was something that most people couldn't possibly see in this fierce persecutor. Mm. But God saw yes. something was going to happen. Hold it. I liked that word that uh, was used in the translation for the verse that um, he writes, like, I became obsessed with this, almost like, you know, he couldn't think about anything else. Um, and I kind of think that sometimes, um, I agree that can be also a personality thing, but also can be a tendency that when we get into something that's not healthy for us, that it can take over our lives. Mm -hmm and that God instead, he offers, you know, a freedom where we can turn that energy, maybe a healthy focus, like Paul eventually, Saul became converted and he, he turned that obsession to something good and um, he wasn't like a slave to it. Amen. You know, it's a really good point because he wasn't just zealous about his faith mm -hmm. or God. He was obsessed about forcing these people to renounce Christ. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it seems like something unhealthy, an unhealthy spiral was happening for him. Good point. Acts chapter 9. Michael, if you could pick up his, another place where he gives his testimony. Acts chapter 9 verses 1 to 9 is what we call the Damascus Road conversion. Yes, reading from the New Revised Standard Version. It says, Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and through his eyes, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So um, I. I was saying it's his testament. Actually, Luke, of course, is writing it. But you remember the physician Luke traveled with Paul. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe sometime he sat down and said, so... How'd it go? Paul, that's his name. <laughs> Saul, Paul, tell me what really happened there. And, and, and this story is recounted because, of course, Luke was not there at the time. Mm. He tells the story. What do you think went through his mind, Saul of Tarsus, when when he heard a voice from heaven call him by name, mm. Saul, Amazing. Saul, mm -hmm. why are you persecuting me? I think like Rodney said, I think he sincerely, genuinely believed that he was doing what was right. And for, you know, all of a sudden this supernatural being to appear to him, call him out by name and tell him basically what you're doing is wrong, I think he's just in shock. Like, is, is everything that I've believed in completely wrong? Does he know at this point who's talking to him? Mm. He says, well, who are you? Well, he does. He says. He tells him who he is. Okay, so there's some supernatural being talking to him, right? He's assuming it's the Lord, right? Rather than just the wind in the blowing through them, whatever he's passing through the air. So, so this supernatural being saying, you're persecuting me. And what's, what's his question? Verse 5. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> Lord, <laughs> now, I, I recognize that you're higher in authority than me. Yeah. Who are you, Lord? And, and what was the answer that I'm Michael read to us? Jesus. I am Jesus. Jesus. Man, you persecute. Not just I'm Jesus but I'm Jesus who you are persecuting. Who you are persecuting. You are persecuting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now what's going through his mind, Lourdes? I can't even imagine because all these people were talking about Jesus, Jesus, and he didn't have an encounter with him, and now he's face to face with the one he 
thought he never existed. And it was his first encounter with, with, with the Lord. So Jonathan, what's, what's he thinking? I mean, you, you know, you're a computer specialist, right? He's doing this computer search and, you know, what? Hard drive crash. Huh? Hard drive crash. Hard drive crash. I mean, like, it's like his system's going down. Yeah. What do you imagine is going, going? What, what? have I done? Um, could it be that I, everything I've stood for is wrong? I've. I mean, I th I, yeah, I just I think he's just totally paralyzed and just like, oh. Lord. By the way, is everything he stood for wrong? No, not everything. No, no. He believed in the God of heaven, yeah. right? And he wanted to live, but but he rejected the Messiah, mm -hmm. right. Right? right? It's like, oh no. Now, what's his next thought? Let me ask you this question, Nancy. Do you think that Saul of Tarsus understands the unfailing love and the grace of God? Hmm. I'm not sure that he did because of the, I mean, the God he was, he was proclaiming was, I mean, he, he was persecuting Christians. He, he thought that it was okay with God to imprison and kill them. I mean, I don't know that he understood about. What do you think, God Michael? Do you agree or disagree? Did, I believe. I'm he, not going to judge him because I don't know. I'm just asking. I believe he knew, but he was misguided. Okay. So he believed that God was a God of love. Uh, you know, he's got two options at this point, you know. If he had a, if he had a gun, which he didn't because we didn't have them then, but he probably had a, a, a sword of some kind, would be to kill himself. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm. oh, no, what have I done? Mm. Uh, right? Judas. Right. right. Mm. What have I done? Um, or to somehow maybe believe that some of the love and grace of God that he's believed might be revealed to him. I don't know. But probably all of those thoughts are just crashing into each other in his head, right? Rodney? This is another example, um, as we discussed in a previous study, about cut to the heart. Mm. Mm. He was brought to a point, if we could slow the picture down, he was brought to a point that he had to make a decision. If you notice his question thereafter is, Lord, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. So it was a deep conviction that he experienced right there and then. He had to make yeah. a decision, sure. and he did make the decision. So you're the right using decision. the language that we've, we've quoted yes. twice in the book of Acts. Once, uh, day of Pentecost sermon, mm -hmm. 3,000 are cut to the heart, right? Mm -hmm. And they are baptized, right? Yes. They repent, they're baptized. And then in, in Acts 7, who's cut to the heart? The, the leaders. The religious leaders, and what do they do? They, they kill Stephen, Stephen, right? Mm -hmm. Because they resist that conviction. So you're seeing this, I, I think Jonathan used the expression, a deep conviction. Deep conviction. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and he chooses to say, you're Lord, mm -hmm. right? What do you want me to do? Now, before we go on, the Lord had said, it's hard for you to, and it uses this, you know, kick, mm -hmm. kick, right? It's hard for you to kick against the goads or what what what's that talking about does anybody know there are these sticks that have a pointy end um, that they used um, on cattle when they were trying to get them to move so what might have been the uh, so we're speaking here about conviction of, of conscience or what stephanie what might have been what might have been the things that were pricking in the back of his conscience while he's being so zealous to try to eradicate followers of Jesus? You know, he had just gone through the stoning of Stephen, too. And so there's also conviction that he had gone through during that time that probably was coming back to him. And maybe, and, though it's not recorded in the book of Acts, repeated over yes. and over again with Christians who refused the blasphemy, mm. right? Mm. Yes. And he's like, what is with these people? Right. Mm. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Jonathan? Yeah, it just struck me that uh, it seems like he's coming to the point where he's, he's feeling this conviction. And it's almost yeah. in mercy that, that Christ is reaching out to him and saying, Paul, Paul, don't you know what you're doing? It's like, it's like he's... It's like in mercy, he's coming and stopping him, and Paul's like, oh, okay, thank you. I mean, but... <laughs> Later he'll say thank you, right? Yeah. Right now, I think he's probably sweating, yeah. Yeah. right? So, so we, have, we have to go on because we could spend the whole hour on this, just on this story. But it says he went to Damascus, and he ate nothing right. and drank nothing, nothing three days. for three days. Can anybody remember a story in the Bible 
where they ate and drank nothing for three days. It was a life and death situation. Es this es like Esther. 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 That's right, Lourdes. Esther, Queen Esther, will eat and drink nothing. Life is at stake. So, so what's the significance that that is repeated here mm -hmm. in Damascus for Saul of Tarsus? What do you think? Anybody? Stephanie? I think it gave him time to, to think about what was going on. Well, he chose that time, didn't he? Right. And he couldn't see, so he wasn't distracted. There was oh, no right. distraction of food, of sight, anything. Mm. It was his time with he and God. So what's he doing during that time? Preparation. Yeah. What's Praying. he doing? Praying. 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 Confessing. Confessing. Yeah. Confessing. He's Confessing. not just saying, help me to have a nice day. <laughs> yeah. Lord, I think he's me. also... Processing. Like um, yeah. processing in his mind the word yes. of God and saying, was he the Messiah? And looking at the how the word revealed that this, in fact, was the Messiah. Yes. Trying to reboot the hard drive, Jonathan. <laughs> like, wait a minute, I have all this data, including prophecies about Messiah being wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities that I didn't really get, right? Yes. And then in mercy, something beautiful happens. I, I never used to understand this uh, growing up. But it's a story recorded in verses 10 through 19 of the same chapter. And uh, who'll read that for us? Have a volunteer? Yes, Rodney. Verses 10 through 19. God, in his mercy, performs another miracle. It's true. And I want you, to, as you hear the story, to tell me what, what's God doing here and how do you see the love and the grace of God in this part of the story? Verses 10 through 19 of Acts 9. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise, and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold... He is praying. Mm -hmm. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, <laughs> how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name mm. before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. So when I first heard this story, I thought, oh, a miracle. miracle. Ananias lays hands on Saul. He can't see. And immediately he can see. But there's actually quite a few miracles in those verses. Yes. What, what, what are some of the miracles that you see in those verses? Give me one. That God gave him a vision. Okay. Was come to God, God gave who a vision? Uh, Saul. Saul first, okay? First. Mm -hmm. first miracle listed there, Lord says, is that Saul not only had the vision on the Damascus Road where he encounters Jesus, mm -hmm. but he now has a vision that someone by the name of, Ananias. even gives the name, is going to come and do what? Hands Lay hands on you and Restore you'll be able to see. So this is the first miracle. Where, where else do you see a miracle in the story? Well, Ananias then has a, a vision and he yeah. believes it and goes there and... That's two miracles, by right, the way. Right, exactly. <laughs> Give me the first miracle. Is it? Okay. First miracle is... He has is, a vision. He has a vision. Right. Saying, set your oh, GPS for this yeah. coordinate. Go to the sea. Pretty accurate, right? Yeah. Yeah. Go to this road, to this person's house. Yes. But, but you, there's another miracle, which is that... That he went. That he went. 
Why is that a miracle? He was a follower of, of God. Yeah. Why is it a miracle that he went? He was afraid of him. Yeah. That's right. And rightly so. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and part of that yeah. miracle is not only that he went, but he called him brother. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Isn't God amazing? Yeah. Yeah. Travis? I think a real miracle here is that God took somebody who was a murderer, you know, consenting to people's deaths and turned him into um, such an amazing uh, preacher, mm. a chosen so, vessel. So where, Rodney, you want to add to that before I ask, I, I want to just say, where do you see the grace and the, and the mercy mm. of God in this story, okay? The, the, the miracle for me was the brother Saul part. Yeah, isn't that amazing? How, how it, th this was a man that was killing people, yeah. uh, Ananias' own people. And Ananias and would have Ananias been dragged off too, been killed right? too. And the way how he approached Saul, it's a miracle to me. He said, mm. brother Saul. <laughs> so it wasn't Saul that convinced him. It was Jesus that convinced yeah. Ananias and Amen. just believed and he went and he said, brother Saul, mm. welcome. Mm. 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 Yes, take it. Ananias obeyed. That's a miracle. <laughs> he did not question. Mm. He just went and did exactly what God said. He told him, but he's doing this, but God said he is chosen. He did not argue with God and say, how do we choose somebody who's persecuting mm. you? Mm. But he just saw that this is a vessel. He's a chosen one. And he didn't even think to say, to comprehend how. And he just went and did what God told him. He obeyed. That's a miracle for me. So I want to pause for just a moment. This is an amazing story. I hope even if you've heard it many times, and those of you, you're part of our Hope Sabbath School team, you say, I've heard this before, but God is teaching us new lessons, right? Yeah. So would anybody like to share a time? Put yourself in Ananias' shoes, okay? When, when God asked you to do something and your natural reaction was, Oh, I don't know <laughs> yeah. if I really want to do that. But somehow God gave you the courage, Lourdes, to do it. Yeah. And, and he also gave you the strength to, yeah. to go through it. Uh, about five years ago, uh, we traveled to the beautiful country of Zambia. We were uh, there to preach in evangelistic series. Uh, we went, we, when we got there, uh, the first Sabbath, we visited a church to meet the members. And... Um, after church, after church, we stayed there for a lunch. And in the lunch, the elder asked me, can you stay so you can have some words with the congregation? I was like, of course. Thinking that... By the way, you're not a preacher, right? No, 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 Okay, no. but you were there kind of as a lay... Yeah, we were going to preach, but that day I had no... Uh, we just were just there going at church. to visit our, our members, meet okay. them for the first time. Okay. And when they asked me, can you have some words? I thought he meant invite the congregation to come for the next two weeks for the meetings that we were going to have. Uh, right after we finished, he asked me, are you ready? And I'm thinking, oh no, he asked me to probably give a, a message, a sermon. I'm not ready. And as we walk in front of the church, I'm desperately looking for Bible verses, <laughs> thinking what I'm going to do. Can anybody relate? Oh, okay. Yeah. Right when we got to the front, um, I asked him, so how long is the message supposed to be? And he told me, oh, about an hour <laughs> <laughs> oh, until the pastor gets back after visiting other elders. So here I am in front of a congregation, about 200, 300 people eagerly to hear what I have to say, to hear the message, and I have no message. Mm -hmm. While they were singing, I just prayed with my whole heart and said, Lord, <laughs> you deliver this message. And I remember, I don't remember much of the message, but as I was talking away, uh, I remember seeing someone familiar and I just kept going. And after a while, I remember, oh, that's the pastor. So uh, then that was my moment to stop. But it just reminded me that it's not about us. It's Amen. about him. Yes. And it's not about strength. It's his strength. That's and right. it was a very humbling experience. Ooh, and actually, God had been preparing Lourdes all of her life. Yes. Right? Oh, yeah. You might go, I don't have time to prepare. But that's the amazing thing, isn't it? When, when we step out. Haiti, did I see you raise your yeah. hand too? I did. It's pretty similar to Lourdes' story, um, but I wasn't on a mission trip. Um, one day as I was studying a few years ago, um, and I was studying a particular message, I felt convicted in my heart by the Lord that I needed to preach that message. And I'm not a preacher either, and I wasn't an elder or anybody important in church, but I felt convicted by that, and I felt like Ananias, no, Lord, I'm not comfortable with this. Um, but he continued to insist that I do this, 
so much that finally I said, I will go. I don't know how to do this. Is that a dangerous prayer to pray, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> You're just saying, God, I'm available. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm. What happened next? I spoke to the pastor and I said, I have a message and I want to preach. And he was just like, you know, you've never preached. And <laughs> just looking at me like I was kind of crazy. Um, but he said, all right, I'll look at the calendar and I'll give you a date. Mm -hmm. And he actually forgot. And I had to ask him multiple times, oh. which was very difficult for me because I was literally terrified. And eventually I got my date. I went and I stood up and I was literally shaking. Uh, but by the end of it, I felt more calm and the Lord was with me. Mm -hmm. And I even had people come and tell me, oh, your message touched me. And I was like, what? I don't know how. Um, and I felt relief because I had done what the Lord asked me. So why do you think the Spirit of God impressed these two ladies, Lourdes and Haiti, to share their testimony? You're watching, some of you are watching uh, from somewhere around the world and you're thinking, I think the Spirit's talking to me um, and, and He wants me to do something and to give Him my fears and my anxieties and just do what He asked me to do, mm. right? Well, we could spend the rest of the hour on that one, but thank you for sharing. Very powerful. Let's go to Acts chapter 9, verses 20 through 25, because he's been um, prayed for. Scales fall off of his eyes, he can see. Mm. And uh, Nancy, could you read verses 20 through 25? Let's see what happens next. Okay, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Immediately, he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on, his, on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them abound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. What do you learn, Travis, from that little piece? He's just become a confessed follower of Jesus. Baptism is a public confession, right? I believe in Jesus as my Savior and Lord. I want to follow him all the days of my life. Uh, and and he, what, what do you learn from, from the verses that follow? That the power of Jesus is amazing. <laughs> immediately he goes. He goes immediately. Nothing could stop him. Uh, I just think that um, when, you, when you experience the love of Jesus in your life, that it's hard to keep somebody's mouth shut. You just can't. You can't help but tell of, of what you've seen and heard. And he's so powerful... They want to yeah. kill him. Yeah. They want to kill him. The, mm -hmm. the people that were welcoming him mm -hmm. to drag off the Christians mm -hmm. now want him dead. Mm -hmm. Stephanie? Well, I think it's interesting, too, that, you know, when you make that decision for Jesus, it's not always going to be the easy road. Mm -hmm. And he, he made that decision. He had to be brave because um, they were going, they were pulling on his previous life and saying, isn't this, look at his past history, and that's mm. easy to do. Mm. Yeah. And we actually don't encourage folks when we do that, but he was going up against the stream. Mm -hmm. He's going to face challenges, but yeah. God's got something in mind. There is yeah. actually a gap between verse 25, the basket, and when Saul had come to Jerusalem. And that was actually a pretty significant amount of time, Jonathan. If mm. you go to Galatians for us, chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. In another reference writing to Christians in Galatia, Paul tells us that something happened at that point. Yeah. Um, and that's very interesting and we want to see that there is actually some more preparation than just the three days of fasting and prayer. Yeah. All right, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Down through verse 18. 
For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. That's kind of interesting, isn't wow. it, Nicole? There's like a gap there in the Acts record. How long is he in Galatia? Three I mean, years. And, excuse me, in Arabia? Arabia for three years. For three years, and what's happening during that time? He's preaching the gospel. Preaching. Well, you actually read verses 11 and 12 as well for us, Jonathan. It says he received revelation from God. Let's look at two examples of that in his writings in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 1 Thessalonians 4. Holder, do you have 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 15? We'll see that, that he, was, he was in some serious training during that time. Undoubtedly, remembering all he'd studied, but also receiving revelations from the Lord Jesus. How does it read in 1 Corinthians 11, 23? I'm reading from the New Living Translation. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread. Now, if we read the whole passage, what's that talking about, Michael? Lord's Supper. Yeah, the Lord's Supper. Yeah, so <laughs> communion service, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so was he there on the, no. that night in the upper room? No, no, of course he wasn't. He wasn't even a follower of Jesus, right? So how did he know about everything that happened and what Jesus said? Was what did he say? Him. How did he know? He had been he revealed. Told yeah, it was revealed to him, mm. okay? okay? What about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 15? 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 15. Let's see. Stephanie, could you sure. read that for us, please? And I'll be reading from the King James Version. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. He goes on to talk about the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, shout. and with the voice of the archangel. Very specific. <laughs> and with the trumpet of God. God. And the dead in Christ will. Rise. It's, it's all there. It's really specific. How did he know all of that? He says. The Lord told him. The Lord what does it say at the beginning? Huh? The By the word of the Lord. Yes. Right? Whether that was a vision or a direct conversation or a dream, mm -hmm. the Lord revealed to him those yeah. details. Mm -hmm. So. What do you think significant about the fact that he's obviously very zealous immediately, Travis, right, after he's baptized, but uh, he gets lowered down in a basket, and for three years he's, he's off in Arabia uh, just studying and receiving revelation from God. What, what does that tell you? Anybody? Must tell us something, because after three years he Was went to Jerusalem. What do you think, Rodney? Preparation is very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can think of preparation in terms of time, but we also need to ensure that during that time of preparation, it is the Holy Spirit that is revealing yes. exactly what you wish for me to do. Because we can do things immediately, but not the right things that we should be doing immediately. So we need to ensure that we are guided by the Holy Spirit and mm -hmm. ask for His leadership. I'm with you. I think he was doing the right thing immediately, right? He was sure. preaching that sure. Jesus was yes. the Christ. But uh, he maybe had to unlearn some things, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, maybe had to unlearn. Can you think of someone else that God led off into a yeah. desolate mm -hmm. region to unlearn some things? Moses. 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 <laughs> That's right. He was highly trained in all of the skills of the Egyptians. And Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was highly trained. Right, under Gamaliel. Lourdes? He also needed time one on one with God. He heard about this Jesus, but it wasn't personal. He needed to develop this relationship before he talked about him. Mm -hmm. So then he can go away and say, you know what, for me to live is Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, no longer I who lives, but Christ, Christ lives in me. I mean, you're right. There's a personal experience, not just a who are you, Lord, on the Damascus Road, right? Mm -hmm. That preparation. 
Well, let's, let's bring him back now to Jerusalem. Did you know that he took a three-year break? That's, <laughs> that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Pretty significant break there. We're coming back now to Jerusalem. And uh, what was the um, welcoming committee like? <laughs> well, Autumn, could you read Acts 9 and verse 26 for us? Yeah. I am reading from the New International Version, Acts 9, verse 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing he was really a disciple. So they'd heard this story that had happened how long ago? Three years ago. And where had he been since then? Nobody knew, right? Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden he shows up and wants to spend time with them. And what was the reaction? They're afraid. They're scared. They're afraid. They're afraid of him. Okay. Um, let's look and see what the next reaction is by those who heard him preach. Acts 9, verse 29. Acts 9, verse 29. Tigus, could you read that for us? Acts 9, 29. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenite Hellenists, but they attempt, attempted to kill him. All right. So, Nicole, the uh, disciples were... Afraid of him. And the folks that heard him preach... We're, we're trying to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, things weren't going too well. <laughs> yes. You know, it's funny because God is so graceful that gracious that he took him away for those years to prepare him for what he was going to come back yes. for. Mm -hmm. And so he knew you are not going to be welcomed by those who know who you are, but I'm going to prepare you and get you ready for what you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it just shows his mercy and love for us that he would take that time to get him ready for that. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, I hadn't thought of this, but I'm impressed by the spirit to just ask, have you had an experience where you made a radical turn toward Jesus and some of the people that you were your closest friends and allies just rejected you? Mm. Nicole, why did you look away with a strange look on your face? <laughs> I know you've had some time where you wandered away. You've given that testimony. Right, so I went to a, um, I went to a college and I kind of ran from the church because I'd grown up in the church. Uh, my parents, my mom was very at, a devout Christian. Um, when I went to college, I ran away from the religion, but then I came back. After college, after medical school, I came back. And when I came back, the people who saw me in college did not want to deal with me anymore in, in my new role. So I had to kind of make all new friends. And most people have friendships from, you know, college. I don't have those friendships because I had to kind of be a new person. And with a new person came a new life and a new circle of friends. So they didn't try to kill you. They did not try to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they just kind of... Yeah, they were like, you don't really have what we kind of want anymore. Mm. So you become ostracized mm -hmm. from the, that old group. And into that situation, and isn't God gracious? Mm -hmm. Into that situation, God sends a mentor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's look. You notice I left a couple of verses out here in Acts 9, verses 27 and 28. And hold it, could you read that for mm -hmm. us? 27 and 28. Who does God send into this pretty challenging situation coming back to Jerusalem? I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. So Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. So here's, uh, here's this um, reputable leader. Mm -hmm. he, he's not one of the 12, but he's well respected. Uh, if you missed earlier in the series, we read about him in Acts chapter 4. Let's go back and just read verses 36 and 37. And then I'd like someone to read Acts 11, which gives us a little more of, of the role. Jonathan, could you read verses 36 and 37 of Acts 4? All right. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And Joseph, who is also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. That's interesting. His name was Joseph, or Joseph, uh, but they gave him a nickname. Mm -hmm. The apostles called him 
Barnabas. Barnabas, which means? Son of encouragement. Why did they give him that name? Because he was. Because he was, <laughs> that's right. They said, you know, a good name for you would be Barney. <laughs> <laughs> right? Barnabas. Barnabas, son of encouragement. Not just because he sold a piece of land, but just the way that he was. Mm -hmm. Let's look at one other example. And this is the one that God will lead. Acts 11, 19 to 30. Mm -hmm. Nicole, could you read that? Beginning with verse 19. This is the one that God will send to be a mentor. When some people are afraid of him and other people want to kill him. Acts 11, 19 through 30 in the New International Version says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jer Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and threw stood up and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to prove, provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. Mm -hmm. This they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Mm -hmm. Now it's very interesting if you read the book of Acts, that in early in Acts it always says Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. Mm. Barnabas and Saul. And then it starts saying, Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas. Mm. What does that tell you about this mentor named Barnabas, son of encouragement? Can you see something there? He mentored him into leadership so that now mm -hmm. Paul's name came first. So, so we see this person who's obviously highly respected when the apostles want to send someone to Antioch mm. because Gentiles are coming to faith. Who do they send? Barnabas. They send Barnabas, right? This guy's highly respected. Yes. But what's he willing to do? He's willing to mentor someone who has a, a different reputation than what he did in his past. That's right. And as he mentors him, he becomes a leader. To step back. Yes. He decreases. Uh -huh. Awesome. He decreases. Mm -hmm. that, that's a sign of what? Humble. Humble. Humility. Humility. That's Humility. right, isn't it? He's willing to step back. Yeah. And encourage. encourage. And encourage uh, someone that some people were afraid of and other people wanted, wanted, to, kill. To, kill. wanted to kill. So yeah. I want you to think about your life. We've got another passage to look at. But can someone say, God gave me someone like that. Yeah. Someone that was she or he was a mentor to me and just kind of encouraged me on the way. Anybody have a testimony to share? Mm. No? Yes, Michael. When I was in high school, I had uh, two young uh, men who were working at that high school. And even though sometimes I would uh, be disrespectful um, to faculty and staff, those two guys always set a great example for me. And they never, uh, like Barnabas, they never let me down. They were always there encouraging me to keep going, even when I did mess up. Were they fellow students or were they working at the no, school? No, they were, they were uh, teacher and faculty. Mm. But somehow, in spite of some of your yeah. aberrant behavior, <laughs> you kept looking up to them and they were there for you. Mm -hmm. yes. That's a real gift, isn't it? To have someone to be a mentor for you. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we need to look at our last passage because God promises continued guidance. Acts 22, verses 17 to 21. And Lourdes, could you read for us Acts 7, uh, 22, beginning with verse 17 through verse 21. Uh, there's some encouragement that, that we find here. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Uh, when I had returned to Jerusalem and I was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testi testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that I am one synagogue after another. I am in prison and beat those who, and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who kill him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So what encouragement do you hear in that, uh, in that testimony that uh, Paul now records? By the way, Paul's his Roman name. We'll talk about why he, his name changes, because he's going from Saul, Jewish Hebrew name, to the Gentiles, Paulos, Paul. Um, what, what do you hear there that's encouraging from the Lord? Hmm. Nicole? That even he knows our history, he knows where we've come from, and he's going to put us in a place where we're going to succeed. And so, from, at least for me, when I see this, he says, go, I'll send you away to the Gentiles. He knows that Paul has a gift and he has a, a mission, and he's going to put him in a place where he's going to succeed, even if he's... Um, He's going to send him to a place he's going to succeed because he's willing to go. So I've got a question as I read this text because the Lord says, you need to get out of here. They're not receiving your testimony. What have they been trying to do to him? Kill him. Kill him, right? And he recounts all of the bad things he's done. What's going on there? It's almost like, well, I guess I deserve it. Deserve it. I deserve it, but they should know better because I used to. I don't know what's going on. And the Lord just says, go. just go. <laughs> <laughs> What does that tell you about the Lord? Merciful. He's protecting us. And it's according to His will and according to His time. So I want you to share with me in the few minutes we have remaining, a time maybe when you needed to hear a word from the Lord, uh, an assurance that He would protect you, He would be with you. Uh, you're doing what He's asking you to do, and He brings a word of encouragement to you. Does anyone have a testimony like that? Stephanie? Well, I can think about several times when I was seeking God's leading. And um, there's a verse in Psalm 32. I don't know if we can read We that. can. Just Psalm tell us where it's found. 32, verse 8. Psalm 32 and verse 8. Verse, yeah, and it just really gives encouragement that, that God will guide us and he will, he will be there every step of the way. Go ahead and read that for us in your translation. And I'll be reading from the... King James Version, Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Mm -hmm. So there were several times that that happened yes. for you. Yeah, very clearly. Uh, he brought a scripture to you. All right, mm -hmm. someone else? Rodney? There's a verse whenever I feel uh, I'm in a situation where there is no way out or my back is against the wall. There's a verse... Uh, in Psalm 34 and verse 7, if you could read it. Sure. Psalm, Psalm 34, 34. It's right next door. That's right. <laughs> Psalm 34 and verse 7. And it goes. So here you're, you're kind of putting yourself, I guess, in Saul or Paul's yes. shoes mm -hmm. where he's, his life is at risk. Yeah. And the Lord wants to bring some encouragement to him. And, and this word comes as an encouragement to you. That's right. And it says, the angel... Reading from the New King James Version, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Amen. And by the way, the word fear there, we've learned this in our study, would mean awe, awe. awe reverence, respect, Fair. right? Yes. So those who have a loving connection with him, Amen. he's going to protect us, right? Mm. Anyone have another either testimony or a promise that encourages you? As we wanting to do what God asks us to do, we may come under attack. Travis, is there a word that, that God brings to you as an encouraging word? Well, I think when I, especially in my conversion experience, I just remember, I think Philippians 1, 6, or he's promised to finish the work Amen. he started. Amen. So when I slip or I stumble, I'm not going to stay down. I'm going to stay focused and claim that promise. That you know, it's interesting because uh, the Philippian letter was written to Christians who were suffering, yes. right? 
And, and it's interesting that Paul says, being confident of this. Mm -hmm. right, this very thing. That the one who began a good work will, complete it. will, complete. will bring it to completion. Yes. Why, why do you think he can say that, Nicole? Being confident of this. Because he experienced it himself. Yes. And he can be confident that God's going to do it for the rest of us. He had faced mm. insurmountable odds. He'd been stoned, beaten with rods, shipwrecked bitten with a viper which he shook off into a fire. Mm -hmm. I'm confident Amen. Yes. one who began a good work will bring it to completion. What's the most important lesson you've learned from the study of Paul's conversion? Lourdes? The guy had a purpose in his life. Mm -hmm. God had a purpose. He could have died. So many things happened to him, but God had a purpose. And that's a calling to us. If I, my heart still beats today, it's for a reason. Mm -hmm. And this reminds me of the Bible verse. I can't remember where it says, even though you walk through the fire, you won't get burned, or you, mm -hmm. uh, you pass through uh, the waters, you will not drown. God holds his life for a reason. And he has, mm -hmm. he has a, we have a reason to be here at this moment. So you're telling me, and I think the words you used, and I'll share this with our uh, Hope Sabbath School family. If your heart's still beating, mm -hmm. if you're still breathing, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. by the grace of God. Amen. And He has a purpose for you. If you've already committed your heart to Jesus, He's got a special work for you to do. If you haven't yet, He's kept you alive to save you so that you can make a difference. He sees the potential that we all have, right? Yes. Uh, potential beyond our wildest imagination to be uh, His servants and a channel of blessing. Mm. Would you pray with me? And if you're, especially if you're saying, I need to, I need to just... Say, God, thank you for keeping me alive so that I can accept your salvation. Would you do that today as we pray? Mm. Father in heaven, this message of grace in the story of Saul's conversion touches each one of our lives. Thank you that you see infinite potential by your grace in each one of us. May we surrender to you each day and see you work in wonderful ways. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Well, thanks for joining us for Hope Sabbath School. You know, the miracle that we read about in Saul of Tarsus can be your miracle, can be your testimony. And it's not just so that you can brag about how changed you are, but you can take the miracle and go out and be a blessing to those around you.